recording has begun. Everyone click on there. Thank you. Good evening. I'm now calling the Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to order. Time is 7.03 p.m. Please note that in accordance with government code section 54953E3, this meeting is being held by teleconference only. Because we're video conferencing, we will follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when commissioners, staff, presenters, and the public will provide comments. If you've called into the meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing your comment for the benefit of the recording. Please practice considerate video conferencing etiquette by muting your line when you're not speaking uh, and limiting distractive behavior on camera. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Commissioners, I will be conducting all roll calls this evening in the same order. Please remember the order so that you are prepared to provide your comment or vote. President Spreen? Here. Vice President Sherlock? Present. Commissioner Besigi? <coughs> Jim? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> see him speak there you go <laughs> just for the record if you could say here <laughs> all right <laughs> uh commissioner tonka yeah commissioner tyson here commissioner vaughn here commissioner warren here okay we have seven commissioners present for the benefit of the recording i'll also conduct a presenters consultants and staff roll call fire chief curd here Santa Clara County Weed Abatement Manager, Mo Kumre. I know he's, he was there. Here. There you go, thank you. Here. <laughs> Strategic Planning Consultant, Scott. Present. Emergency Services Manager, Gluhan. Present. Operations Manager, Barnett. Present. Okay. Programs Planning and Grants Manager, Rendler. Present. Okay. General Manager, Logan. Present. Lead Deputy County Council Cheldon. Here. Okay. Cert Program Analyst Beebe. Here. Uh, Los Altos Hills County Fire District Engineering Consultant Tarantino. Here. Okay. Uh, we have Cowell Water District Manager Dawn Smithson. I don't think I saw that. She is on her way. Okay. And uh, Cowell Water Operations Manager Chris Wilson. I believe also on his also, way. I actually see him there on the list. <laughs> uh, Cal Water Regional Community Affairs Specialist Rob Seeley. Here. You're there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Los Altos Hills County Fire District Videographer Ricketts. Here to count for. Okay. Uh, Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council CEO Seth Chalet. Present. Good evening. Good evening. And I also saw our uh, Santa Clara County uh, Fire Safe Council uh, Rep uh, Armstrong. Present. And I hope I got everybody because people are, <laughs> the list keeps getting bigger, but uh, this is the presenters, consultants, and staff accounted for. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. This is one of our largest attendance of participants, to quite a long list. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, this is uh, now item two on the agenda for uh, time for commission president remarks. I really don't have anything uh, other than we want to uh, explain that we do have a breakout room arranged for members of the public if they do want to be here to discuss um, an item of the um, uh, of the uh, let me see which item on the agenda it is here. If they want to speak outside of the public meeting on the, uh, which item is it? Uh, item five. Item five. five. Item five. Um, if you're here to, to speak about uh, your, your property with respect to item five, if you'd like to speak with uh, members of that group while this meeting is proceeding, uh, our staff has put together a Zoom breakout room that can be used to go there and speak uh, off the record, outside the meeting, anything informal you wanna talk about and get any information you might need. Um, so that when we actually get to that item in the meeting, we can uh, uh, do the official business. Uh, I think it'll be more casual. Do we have any members of the public here for that item? I don't see anyone that I don't recognize, so I doubt it. But if you are, um, do we have a process we should use for that? 
Roger, Denise, Glue, and I have the breakout room ready. Mm -hmm. um, and we can arrange uh, for them to come into that. Eugenia Rendler will uh, organize if there's multiple people. Great. Okay. Well, again, thank the staff for doing that. It's uh, beyond my technical abilities to put that together. And I appreciate them uh, being Zoom experts to make that work. President Spring, can I interrupt you for one second? Please. Can you make Dave Barnett a co host, please? I did. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. In that case, we are ready to move forward to item three, public comment. Persons wishing to address the commission on any subject not on the agenda may do so now. Please note, however, the commission is not able to undertake extended discussion or action tonight on items not on the agenda. Items may be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on the next available agenda. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker, unless the number of speakers requires the commission president to impose shorter time limits. I don't see that being the case this evening. Do we have any public comments on items not on the agenda? I see uh, Steve Jordan has his hand raised. Steve, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Steve Jordan, president of uh, uh, Prism Hills Water District. Um, basically, I wanted to call your attention to where we are. Uh, Prisma would like to install um, leak detection hydrant caps on some of the hydrants, you know, in our, in our district uh, for the purpose of detecting leaks before they become breaks. Um, this was approved by County Fire in May of 2019 and approved by the commission itself in July of 2019. Um, for inf your information, San Jose Water is using these to uh, to, and installing about 10,000 throughout a good portion of Santa Clara County and has had great success. So these are approved uh, by county fire, same county fire uh, that, that uh, you know, serves our district. Um, Parisima is an independent county water district with a board of, a, of directors elected by our citizens. We're responsible to the rate payers and we must, our, must invest the rate payer funds wisely. Um, at the present time, it's our understanding that county council is insisting upon the ability to basically order us to remove these uh, with 90 days notice. Uh, we're talking about an investment that could be about a half million dollars or so between capital and uh, subscription commitments. Uh, so it, we can't, you know, I guess we wouldn't be using our ratepayer funds wisely if we, if the county could order us to um, to take them all off, uh, at, you know, with 90 days notice. The uh, the cost of these hydrant leak sensors is zero dollars to the fire district, so we don't think it should be treated as something that the county needs this sort of really tough language to get an escape from. Um, so, and we had asked for this to be on the agenda today, it, you know, because we're still in negotiation. It wasn't uh, something that uh, that the the president thought was was uh, we were ready to do yet. But we would like, to, if we're not able to reach an agreement uh, within the next thirty days, we would like to have this item on the agenda for the August meeting. Uh, so those are that's that's basically what I wanted to communicate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as this item is not on the agenda, we, we won't be discussing this here. Uh, I will repeat one thing Steve mentioned that this is actively under uh, discussion with our staff and our council, um, which is one reason why I won't be discussing it now. And that is our normal process that our staff and council work all our contractual items through. And when they're ready for a recommendation to the commission, uh, we will have that. And I'm sure that will be coming up sometime in the next upcoming meetings. Thank you. I see we have another hand up. Alan? Yes, thank you. I'd like to speak on the same topic. Uh, this, this item has been um, in process for now almost three years. We're talking about a simple addition of a pumper cap to the face of existing hydrants. It's just unfathomable to understand why it takes three years to approve this, this type of uh, requirement. Um, the, the, the fire district itself had a leaky hydrant that ended up um, undermining the road. 
that cost um, $70,000 to replace, it might have been a fraction of that cost if that pumper cap had been attached to that hydrant. So um, I appreciate you have to do things according to policies and procedures, but it just seems inconceivable that it takes three years to make a decision for something as obvious and necessary as these types of pumper caps. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Again, this is an item that is under active discussion with our staff and council. And I, and I know that, uh, Alan, you always like us to do things by the book. I think that's what we're, our staff and council is doing quite uh, well to make sure we follow county standards. And uh, I'm very sure our staff is, uh, and I, I know for sure that uh, all the right procedures are being followed. I'm very proud of them for that. Uh, any other comments from the public? Seeing none. We will uh, now move on to item four, consent calendar and changes to the order of the agenda. Uh, are there any comments from staff on these items, either the consent items or order of agenda? Um, yes, President Spreen, I'd like to make a comment. Please. Um, I would like to uh, request um, the removal of agenda item number 11, uh, which is about the uh, financial audit. Uh, professional services agreement, uh, we would like uh, to bring that item back on a future uh, meeting agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, can I, uh, can I, point of question, can I just accept that change or do we need to include that as a motion for the commission to approve that? I think it would, it would just fall under changes to the agenda. Great. Uh, which is what, which is the item we're on now, and the board would just approve the agenda as amended, so that the minutes would reflect that the commission deleted that item to today's agenda to be re to be reheard at a later meeting. Great, thank you. Any other comments from staff on the consent items? Okay, um, seeing none. Are there questions from the commission on these items? Uh, or any commissioners like to make changes to the consent calendar or the order of the agenda? I see Mark. Yes, one question, 4E, um, continuing resolutions around COVID and COVID-19 question is how much longer do we think that this is gonna be in place? I mean, we can go to Costco and we can go to a baseball game. So I'm starting to question how long we're gonna keep doing this. I mean, we're obviously following the county's direction, I believe. It's set by the county. I'd be happy to answer that, Chairperson Spreen. Please. Um, as a as a county affiliated body, uh, generally, um, you're correct, Commissioner Warren, that the district follows the county. The Board of Supervisors takes up the issue on a monthly basis, consistent with state law. So it's done on a month month to month basis. As you might imagine, there's you know sort of scuttlebutt, um, and you know when when at least for the county board of supervisors and county agencies things might change. There's nothing official yet, and as you know, COVID keeps sort of going up and down. So the and I get asked this question a lot, and I talk to the clerk of the board a lot. And as of right now, the, the board of supervisors is making a decision on a month month to month basis. All right, thank you, thank you, Chris. Roger, you're on mute. Thanks, sorry. Uh, any other any commission comments on uh, consent items or changes to agenda? Not seeing any. One comment I'd like to make is I would like to encourage people to make sure they've read item 4F. In particular, that's the uh, report on the, G the GIS utilization uh, and application for district programs. That particular is an item that I think does a great job of showing how much that's really advanced, how we're using that, um, and how that's entering to be so necessary for all our programs. So I hope everyone takes the time to, to read that if you haven't already. Um, okay, uh, I will now entertain a motion. Will the commissioner making the motion and the commissioner seconding the motion, please state your names for the benefit of the recording. Would anyone like to move? Warren moves to adopt the consent ag agenda with the removal of item, what is that, nine? To a, uh, 11. Uh, 11 to a future date. Thank you. Uh, any second? Sherlock seconds. Great. Thank you. 
Um, the item is now open for discussion. Any discussion on that from the commission? Did I expect any? Great, okay, any public comment on this item? Uh, Alan, I see your hand still up. I don't know if that's still up from before or whether you wanted another comment now. No, I'd like to comment on two items. Okay, you uh, have the floor. Thank you. I'd like to comment or ask a question about 4F. 4F is the um, links agreement and the GIS and part of the original agreement in November of, of 2020 was a project to um, locate all hydrants, laterals, gateway valves, and incorporate that specific data into the GIS system. Uh, my question is, is has that uh, uh, project been completed? With regards to item number 11, which had to do with uh, awarding a contract without any competitive bids uh, for an audit, um, I, I read the description about piggybacking. I can understand piggybacking when you're buying the same item, a, a desk or a chair, or, or even a fire engine. But uh, the concept of piggybacking for audit services for two different organizations uh, doesn't make um, competitive sense to me. Yes, it may save you some time with regards to uh, vetting um, and checking references on the auditor, but it doesn't assure you that you've received a competitive price. Um, so, uh, and, and then secondly, I'd say that, you know, in 2014, when the district had no employees, um, we put together a uh, bid, um, uh, an RFP. We, we went out, uh, got 14 organizations to take a look at it, received a number of uh, uh, <coughs> bids. And so I, I don't understand why we have an organization now with five full-time employees, a half a dozen part-time employees, a million dollars a year uh, salaries and can't uh, go out for competitive bids for, for an audit. Thanks for the opportunity. I think as the uh, proposal is to take this off the agenda and bring it back next month, that would be the time for details uh, about the status of this item. I do appreciate, Alan, that you're advocating us taking our time and doing things right, which I think is the right process for us in contractual items, uh, as we sort of mentioned earlier. Uh, any other public comments on the consent calendar? Oh, actually, there's any comments on the uh, GIS mapping of the hydrants? Do we have any information on that or do we wanna come back with that next month with an answer to that question? Oh, we'll come back next month. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. We'll, we'll look into that, get that status for you. Okay, um, let's see. If no further discussion, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spring? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Basiji? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Okay, and the motion passes as amended, seven to zero. Great, thank you. We will now move on to item five, the public hearing. This is the public hearing on the proposed special assessment cost associated with the abatement of hazardous weeds, brush, and or rubbish on certain described properties that were declared to be a public nuisance. Um, we should add that this is uh, the town's process as opposed to the county process, which we talked about at the June meeting. Uh, weed abatement manager, Mo Kumre, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, please provide the commission and public with a brief overview of the abatement process. Thank you, and yes, you pronounced it close enough. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> uh, so this is the third step in, in a three-step process. Back in December, you declared weeds, brush, and rubbish public nuisance. In January, you had a public hearing to allow people in the program to contest their inclusion in the program and authorize my department to uh, inspect and perform abatements for properties where the property owners failed to comply. This is the final part where we're submitting to you the fees to be submitted to the tax collector that will go on the property tax bill and an opportunity for property owners to contest any of those fees. Um, if there are any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And just to clarify, anyone who's on this list who we're discussing tonight 
have already had previous public hearing chances to discuss the status of their property. Every That's person on this list had to have been on the list in December. Yes, exactly. Great, any, any questions from the commission? Great, thank you very much. Um, I will now open the public hearing. Time is 7.23 please, p.m. Please note if any members of the public would like to contest the inclusion of their name or parcel number in Exhibit A of Resolution Number 22-16 of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to adopt weed abatement, abatement report and order cost of abatement to be a special assessment on the identified properties, now is the time to do so. Any and all persons interested in having any objections to said list or to any matter contained therein may appear and be heard. Are there any comments from the public? I don't see anyone on the participants list that I don't recognize and I see no hands. So I, I agree there. I do not see any public comment. Okay. Um, let's see, hearing none, the public hearing is now closed. The time is 724 p.m. Let's see, uh, so this brings us to item B, adopting resolution number 22-16 of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners, adopting weed abatement report and ordering cost of abatement to be a special assessment on the identified properties. I believe that is the longest title we've had uh, this year. Um, are there any clarifying questions from the commission on this? I expect none and I see none. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion and a second. Please identify your name. Tyson moves approval. Warren seconds. Thank you, Tyson and Warren. The item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Seeing none, are there any additional public comments on this item? Seeing and hearing none, if there's no further discussion, we will now vote on the resolution. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spring. Yes. Vice President Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner Basigi. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Vaughn. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Yes. And the motion passes seven to zero. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Coomery. Uh, will you be leaving the call at this point? You're welcome to. Yes, I will. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We will now move on to item six. Uh, this is receiving the Santa Clara County Fire Chief report. Uh, Fire Chief Kierkegaard, please provide the report. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, I guess, President Spring. My um, internet is showing that it's unstable, so I apologize if I'm cutting in and out. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Oh, could I get um, the ability to share my screen? There you go. Okay, great, thank you. All right, this, is, this uh, report is for the month of June of 2022. Um, we spoke briefly on the structure fire last month uh, that occurred that I, I mentioned would be in this report. Um, and that was uh, the largest dollar value loss of uh, approximately $1.7 million on a home uh, in Rebleta. It was a very challenging fire based on the location of the fire, as well as just the overhaul that was needed, um, even though the crews arrived on scene fairly timely. It was just a complicated, complex uh, location uh, requiring a lot of overhaul hours uh, for the crews. Um, this fire in particular uh, had a full first and I believe a second alarm as well that went to the fire. Engine 75 moved up. They were initially training at the drill tower um, in Campbell when the call came in. So they moved up and covered El Monte uh, Amani Station's area during uh, the incident. Um, overall, uh, there was a little peak in the number of calls for June uh, at 89. Um, not many shifts occurred in terms of the actual percentage, still hovering around 60% for EMS. Uh, service calls, again, near second largest uh, or uh, greatest call by type. 
uh, at 24% here, fire alarms, et cetera. Uh, four fires uh, that we responded to, and again, they may not be fires when we get there, but the actual risk profile in terms of our deployment model, one was for a vegetation fire, one was for structure fire, which is the dollar loss that you see. One was for a vehicle fire on 280, and one was an electrical fire on the top of a telephone pole. Um, that's what you see here in red. These are the four locations of the reported fires in the district. Um, and again, the district's uh, uh, shape file here outlined with the purple here with the Los Trancos area over here, just showing the dis uh, distribution of calls uh, within the district's area. Uh, coming back up here, um, there were two incidents uh, in terms of fires or incident counts with some dollar loss. There was a, uh, the pole fire, I think, had a $2,000 loss. Um, and that's what, what, where you have there. Um, I'd have to double check that. Um, and then um, here is your, again, this is the total calls, 88 for the district. These are the code three responses. We do not count for uh, response time analysis, our calls in which we respond without lights and sirens going with vehicle traffic, stopping at all lights and intersections. So these are, that's the difference here between your urban densities and rural densities. Um, um, I might have to zoom here, here for the, uh, for clarity, uh, we're still averaging four minutes and 34 seconds for engine 76, rescue 74, 546. These are the urban areas. Um, and engine 75 um, only had a couple of calls in the district um, in the area, urban area with 616. Again, these calls all include call processing time, turnout time, and response time. So there are three time intervals that are included in the total response time. We had a call that averaged, uh, again, this is the first unit, uh, first due unit that gets on scene, engine 71 at 1040. They were coming from Cupertino station. It was a vehicle accident on 280 in which engine 76 had to access the freeway, go back up to Foothill Expressway and come back down to actually access where the location of that vehicle accident was. And that's why engine 71 was the first on scene, creating what it looks like to be an outlier, but really it's just the response time or the time it took to, to turn around on the freeway. Here we had 579 uh, 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 programs or attendees for programs, 500 of which were for the town picnic that occurred, uh, I think it was June 5th. Um, and then there were 70 other, 79 other attendees uh, attending CPR classes, a couple of safe sitter classes, a couple of station tours. And um, uh, I think those are all of the community uh, education and risk uh, reduction activities. That is item one. Uh, any questions with that before I move on to the Palo Alto Fire Station 8 report? Okay. So, uh, so again, Palo Alto Station 8 began to be staffed for this fire season on June 15th by Palo Alto Fire. Um, so the report information uh, is garnered from Chief uh, McNally, uh, who sends it to to uh, to me directly, and we uh, take a look at uh, the 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 complete information and then redact information that may be uh, HIPAA sensitive. So we had uh, two EMS calls, uh, one on the 17th, one on the 28th, and then a call canceled en route, and this was for a vehicle accident. Um, sorry, we missed that um, on uh, Montebello and uh, Page Mill Road. Uh, or where Page Mill Road comes out and hits Montebello and that's way up at the top. So um, those are the, the calls that occurred in which station eight units or that unit res uh, responded. Um, this arrival time um, was uh, 10 minutes here. So you, I'm just doing simple math uh, that uh, we didn't get the seconds from Palo Alto. Um, here it looks like it's a eight minute arrival time for this EM MS call and then here, um, they uh, were canceled en route. And that is the report for Palo Alto Station 8 for the month of June of 2022. Any questions? Great. Thank you very much. Um, any other discussion from the commission on these items? Any public comment on the... Oh, wait, uh, Commissioner Tyson has a comment. 
sorry, I realize it's not part of your report, but um, I did hear of a structural fire yesterday or the day before. I wonder uh, if, if you have any info about that. Uh, if it happens the day before, which is on a Sunday, I may not have the total information. I can take a quick peek, but sometimes the ENFERS reporting is not completed for a couple of days as they gather information and fill out the arson, if there is an arson piece uh, or fire investigation piece. So um, I can I can cer sure, certainly report on that uh, next month, but I don't have any intel at my fingertips right now. Okay, I, I heard Mr. about it from the general manager. Um, okay. So on Tafe Road at 619 yesterday. So I never heard if what it was. So okay. just call here next time. Right. Mr. Sherlock? Yeah. Yeah, I had a question about the the pole fire. When a pole fire occurs, is it the fault of the wiring and is it a PG and E issue or what happens afterwards? I have it right here. Let me take a look. It says uh, Rescue 74 responded to a pole on fire. They arrived to find a utility pole. This is all information. Uh, uh, pole, unit, utility pole that has small fire at the top with some electrical arcing. Uh, Rescue 74 isolated the area until PG&E arri PG &E arrived. Um, so basically the unit didn't do anything but basically make sure it did not spread or did not create any more arcing uh, uh, that would have caused uh, you will the uh, uh, the area any vegetation next to it, but it looks like um, and the scene was over to PG &E, um, after they arrived on scene. So this was a PG and E uh, related occur according to the report from the captain, and that was um, off of near Parisma. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm turning my head. I'm looking at the map here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just curious if they if they take action to check other poles for a similar problem, or is it just it happens? It happens. Uh, I'm not sure what PG&E does after this uh, is mitigated by fire. Um, it's certainly okay. something that I think PG&E could probably. I'm sure an incident was uh, created for them because they had a unit respond, um, and it, and it could be something that um, the commission could dig it down into, but fire doesn't have access to that information directly. Okay, great, good enough, thanks. Thank you, any other co commissioner questions or comments? Seeing none, are there any other public questions or comments? I see a hand up from a member of the public. Alan, you have a question? Yes, I'd like to ask the chief, I saw in the newspaper that uh, hand crews are now stationed at Rosona Lake. I was wondering what the status of the hand crews are and uh, where are their first assignments? Thank you. So um, the, we have the uh, fields crew hired their first start date. I apologize for hearing my dogs bark. Somebody's at the front door. So I apologize for hearing that in the background. Um, the, the, they will start on June, July 25th. So they have not actually been onboarded in terms of first day, but we have their equipment in terms of their uh, protective equipment or personal uh, uniforms. Um, we've got the chipper, we've got hand tools, and they will be stationed at Vasona. So in terms of what their first assignment will be, it will be cleaning up that area right next to their work area at Vasona. Um, and that, that's just because um, it's one of the areas that just helps them, um, uh, again, helps the uh, pre-fire manager or wildfire officer see what their skill set is. Um, we know that what their resume or application said, but we want to make sure that we start them off training slowly and ensure that they have the right skill set to do the work that we're, we're requiring of them um, as we build out uh, the projects. Did that, that answer your question, Alan? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other public? Questions or comments? Seeing none, I guess, uh, thank you very much, Chief. And we will now move on to item seven, uh, the general manager report. Uh, general manager Logan, can you please present this? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, do I have a screen share or Victoria, are you going to screen share for me? I'm disabled. Corey, can you make her a- Now you are there you go. no longer disabled. Okay, I will try again. There we go. Thank you. OK. 
Okay. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, cover slide. I'd like to point out a couple of things. One is a certificate on the left, and I will explain that. That's Emergency Management Specialist Certificate awarded to Victoria Beebe. And there'll be some congratulations here in a moment to you, Victoria. And the other is the um, screenshot of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District advertisement that was used for the um, Los Altos Hills, the Los Altos uh, Art and Wine Festival. So um, you'll see some of the, the products of our, our um, public announcements and education and outreach here. Okay, next slide. I'd like to mention that uh, the IT service consultant is now up and running with the district, is benefiting our district team. And we're into a phase that I kind of like the title of, it's called a discovery phase. And that makes everything uh, a little more interesting to us that we're discovering what we can do better with our IT needs and getting our infrastructure set. Um, then uh, the second bullet is General Analyst BB received her Emergency Management Specialist certification from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Congratulations, Victoria. And this certification is for 150 hours. You can see all the various topics that she studied over that time. So we're very pleased to have that kind of expertise and recent training available to the district. And thank you, Victoria, for doing that. Um, I'd like to mention the third bullet is County Procurement. Record review was concluded in July of uh, 2022. So this month, uh, the district now has concluded that work with management audit. And then the next bullet, the Art and Wine Festival occurred and we have, have information uh, on the festival and some of the advertisement we, we did to bring out the public to our table in our booth. And then uh, you'll see the ad next to this on it's always fire season. That's our motto, which will be uh, advertising the district newsletter. And, and it's a digital newsletter. We're very pleased with that. Uh, the next thing I'd like to report is that Dave Barnett, um, who's our operations manager, has given notice that he intends to leave the district on July 31st. And Dave, we regret that you're leaving. We appreciate many, your many contributions as a consultant and operations manager during your tenure here with the district from June 21 to July 31st of 2022. And Dave was instrumental in crafting the strategic community fuel break, working as a team member on the evacuation route projects and led the team for the I-280 Cal OES sub-application grant project and visited with many residents on vegeta vegetation mitigation issues along with other contributions. I will be working with President Spring and Vice President Sherlock on a succession plan for the continuation and distribution of Dave's job duties. And details will be provided to the commission at a future meeting. Um, Dave, again, thank you for your participation with the district over this year. It's been our, our honor and pleasure to have you bring your expertise to the district. And thank you, that's the end of the GM report. Thank you for the kind words and the opportunity to all commission and staff. Thank you so much, Dave. It, uh, you know, I'm the, the, the strategic vision you brought uh, to the team uh, has really uh, changed the district for the better, and uh, we are we are forever changed for you. And uh, sorry to see you go. Any comments from the commission on anything from the general manager's report? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. This is Please Jim, proceed. Proceed. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out for the uh, um, for our booth at the Art and Wine Festival. I stopped there and it was seemed very very complete and very impressive. I have to say that. Unfortunately, not during the time I was there, not many people showed up. But uh, that I'm sure that there were time before or after that people did stop by. I had a fairly fairly uh, consequential conversation about CERT with, uh, with Victoria and that helped me out. And I went ahead and, and basically put my name on a CERT, next CERT class as a result. <laughs> Great. Great. Any other comments from the commission? Uh, seeing none, uh, any public comments on uh, the general manager report? Uh, yes, Alan has a question or a comment or question. You have the floor, Alan. Thank you. It's just a question. Now that the IT consultant is on board, um, 
there was a part of the management audit that required all the district's records to be uh, put up and uh, digitally available. And I have mentioned previously about the uh, um, limited capabilities of the search feature on the district's website. I'm wondering if, uh, if either of those two projects are ones that the consultant is going to assist with and whether those will be of uh, much or what sort of priority they might receive. Thank you. I can certainly address that, which is that, uh, yes, one of our key uh, items for them is making sure all our, all our records are properly archived and searchable and accessible. Um, getting that to the website will be a, a, a second step of that, but that's what they're doing right now is getting all our records and uh, our cloud drives uh, organized and uh, properly uh, secured and backed up and so forth to make sure that, that uh, we can all sleep well at night knowing that those records will be, uh, will be safe. So getting those out to the website will be a, a, another step down the line, but absolutely the status of our records in a publicly searchable way is on their high on their on their list of tasks that we want done in a professional way. Uh, I see a comment from Denise. Your hand is up. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to pass along. I uh, staffed the booth on Sunday at the Art and Wine Festival and had a quite extensive conversation with Co Council Member Mock, who is actually next door neighbors to Robleda Fire. And I just wanted to pass along to County Fire Chief Kirk Gow about his impressive, uh, he was impressed by the rapid response and the professional manner in which the fire was extinguished. I just wanted to, he asked me if I could pass that along. So I wanted to send that um, forward. Thank you. Great, positive words for everyone. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I think that's it for the general manager report. Thank you, general manager Logan. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to item eight, which is a report from Cal Water actually, uh, Report from Cal Water, California Water Service, an overview of the water system improvements, projects, and plans that pertain to Los Altos Hills County Fire District. Um, I want to remind everybody, by the way, that this is a general overview report on the water system improvements. Um, we are, this is not a specific detail uh, discussion of specific projects. Um, that would be, those, those would have to be agendized for future discussion uh, on if we get down to details. So we'll be watching for that. Um, General Manager Logan, please introduce the item and the speakers. Yes, thank you, President Spring. And I'm really delighted to introduce these three speakers and that they were available on such quick notice from our June meeting to this July meeting. And I'd like to welcome uh, California Water Service member Don Smithson. Don is a district manager for Los Altos Suburban District and also Bear Gulch District. And introduce Chris Wilson, who's the operation manager, and Rob Seeley, the regional community affairs specialist. And they will present item eight. So um, I'll turn it over to the three of you and let you uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. I, I think Don's gonna lead in, but if I could get permission <laughs> to share the screen, that would be great. Yes, uh, is that uh, Rob Seeley? Yes. Permission, okay, give me one sec. There you go. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Looks like we're getting into presentation mode. Can you hear me okay? Just testing my audio. I had a, a little technical difficulty, so I'm glad I'm able to make it for this. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Actually, we feel very honored to be part of this meeting and we're happy to come back anytime you wanna chat. We love talking water. We're one of those, we're those nerds who like to talk about water. And since you seem to care about it as well, we're very happy to spend this time with you. So next slide. Um, Jay did a wonderful um, introduction. I'm the district manager of the Los Altos Suburban District, and I also happen to manage the district just north of us, the Bear Gulch District. Uh, Chris Wilson is our operations manager, so he's in charge of all things field related, and Rob Seeley is our regional community affairs specialist extraordinaire, um, and you'll be hearing from all of us this evening. So I just wanted to make a really short uh, presentation or comment a few seconds, just to explain who we are. I've noticed that Cal Water tends to confuse some people <laughs> and rightfully so. We're actually in five different states. States um, Besides California, we're in Hawaii, Washington, New Mexico, Hawaii, Washington, New Mexico, Texas, 
and in California. So this is our California water service. And I just wanted to show you that, you know, we own or operate about 26 water districts all the way from Chico to the north, to the LA area in the south, and the Palos Verdes area is probably about the furthest south we go. But obviously we're mostly concerned about the San Francisco Peninsula. So we're gonna focus next slide on the peninsula. And the reason why I share this with you is because I think it's a very, very cool model. I've really enjoyed working with this model um, because, you know, we here are our districts on the peninsula. The three little dots to the north is our sister Bayshore district. The big bulk in the middle is the Bear Gulch district. And then off to the side in the Sunnyvale area where it says Sunnyvale right there is the Los Altos suburban district. And then you see Livermore across the bay. And the reason why I mention this is because we're actually a really large company, but we're allowed, you know, the flexibility to operate each district in a manner with some flexibility to meet our customers' needs. And you can imagine that, you know, our customer base on the peninsula is very different than maybe our customer base in Chico or Bakersfield or LA. And so we're able to be that mom and pop water company on the corner, <laughs> but we also have the backing of a really large company. Um, when we need it, we have, um, you know, thousands of other employees who are available to assist us when we need, and we can assist them as well. You'll be hearing a little bit more about that. So um, next slide is actually, I'm going to turn it over to Rob Seeley, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about what we do as a company overall as our standardized um, wildfire uh, hardening efforts. Thank you, Don. So I thought I would take a moment to just kind of share with everybody some of the larger picture um, really benefits that Cal Water has when we when we operate a system, um, not only throughout just a, a community or a district, but throughout a state and, and even a region where we have some of our, our Southwest partners over in New Mexico um, and then Northern up in Washington. Um, one of those things is resources. So as Don said, we're able to share resources as needed. And that becomes particularly helpful um, in some wildfire situations. I know it, it was very helpful in the Paradise Fire. Hopefully we never see anything like that down here, but we are able to, to bring not only personnel up, but also to bring equipment, booster pumps and, and other equipment, along with emergency response trailers to really lend a hand where we can and make sure that the fire system is running at peak capacity so that you folks can do your job and, Collectively, we make sure the, the areas that, that we care about so much are, are protected. So I thought resources was an important thing just to give a, a brief overview of, of kind of how we look at that and those benefits. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was EOC. So I know that, um, that we talked about that a little bit in terms of the emergency management uh, just before this, but with Cal Water, we actually operate our own EOCs for, for all incidents, um, be there earthquake, fire, um, COVID was, was a considerably long uh, EOC for us and in some form continues today. But the, the reason I bring that up is because every time we do an EOC, it's a very flat um, communication pattern in terms of disseminating information. People from districts all over California and even outside of California come in to watch our EOC to learn. So every EOC we do, we're evolving, we're learning, we're sharing techniques, and we're building on that. And I think that's really important for, for us as a company to be able to be responsive and quick and nimble with the, the needs that, uh, you know, fire may need when, when there is a wildfire, when there is something like this combat. So it's another benefit that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, the shared knowledge wraps right into that. So again, I, I talked about the flat communication. We have a lot of people internally that come in to view these, to share that info, to, to kind of dissect that as we go along, figuring out new best practices on a, a very quick basis. So it's a fast evolution. And then lastly, I wanted to mention our internal wildlife or wildfire task force. And that is an operations driven task force that year to year gets together and assesses where we can grow in terms of our wildfire preparedness throughout the company. And these individuals meet, uh, I think it's biweekly and check off all the boxes that need to be checked to make sure that we're prepared based on what we understood our needs were last year, as well as bringing new ideas to the table of what preparation can be done now and into the future so that we're even better prepared to react and respond when necessary. So those were four points that I just wanted to bring up before we get kind of from the macro into the micro of the district. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chris Wilson. Thank you. Um, so just a quick overview of the map. Um, this is, of course, the uh, 
more an area that we're all interested about. And the the highlights that I'll point out is, I'm sorry that it's kind of small, but I'm capturing a big area, is the green squiggly lines are areas where we either have completed work or we are planning to do work. So the upper portion that's near the golf course in the country club area, that is Loyola and Eastbrook. And then moving further down the map, that's the, the two dots with the two lines, that's station uh, eight and station 41, which is uh, kind of the feed to the Mora area that um, the, the main questions are about. The other three dots are different projects that we have either just completed or have intent on doing 2023, 24 um, for other wildfire hardening in the area. So the first project that we wrapped up is on Eastbrook, and that was a wildfire hardening project that we started in, in late 2021 and wrapped up in quarter one of this year. Uh, we filled a gap of 1,250 feet of, of eight inch main and added three hydrants to that area. Um, we commissioned the project and tested those hydrants. So we're achieving quite a big flow. Um, in excess of 3,000 gallons per minute um, on the new main. And then there was one hydrant, number 1202, that was on East Brook um, near Partridge that was an existing hydrant. And we uh, replicated the flow there to see um, that we've got a, a 500 and something gallon increase from previous year's data. So good news, you know, we're able to, to substantiate that that improvement was well worth our time. The second one is Loyola. And the reason that I'm talking about something on the wrong side of 280 from Mora is that's how we get water up to the hill, uh, what we refer to as the hill. Um, so getting that water up to the tank at Mora and across the ridge um, of Los Altos Hills is done by feeding water from the foothill area using stations around the golf course across the freeway. So this was more of a reliability. There was some ground movement that we noted on Loyola along with some antiquated mains. So the potential for a failure was uh, increasing as the years went by. And we decided to target that one pretty rapidly and got a project done, uh, I wanna say about two weeks ago um, that we, we wrapped that one up. So now there's new main there and that's gonna be um, a good added reliability to to the district. So in, in the previous years, there had been a study done by EKI that uh, we were asked to kind of speak to. And one of the main concerns was the lack of available flow in the Mora area. So there was a couple of hydrants that were selected where I was able to replicate flows. Um, the Quail Meadows area saw an improve, a small improvement, 164 gallons a minute. Um, the Eastbrook area saw a substantial improvement, 500 gallons a minute. The Mora Heights, um, the original EKI report, Cal Water didn't provide flow data. We didn't have historic data there. And EKI had um, somehow calculated the gallon per minute at that hydrant as 270 gallons, but when we flowed it, we came close to a thousand gallons. So there was one area on Ken Bar, which is inside of what Cal Water terms a designated low pressure zone. That's a zone that operates under 40 pounds routinely uh, pressure and which Cal Water has on file with the state. So that one, we saw a slight drop in the GPM when we re replicated the test is likely due to the demand at the time of the, the day, um, given that it was two o'clock in the afternoon, hot days, things like that can have an impact, but it's not something that we're just sweeping under the rug or not paying attention to. We're, we're logging the data and taking it into factor for future projects. So future projects, the two main projects that Cal Water has as part of our 2021 GRC and these are for being built in the years 2022 through 2024. Um, the first and most important, I think, is Station 41, which is the tank site that Cal Water has up inside of open space um, at the very end of Mora past the, the locked gate. 
that's set to get um, a substantial amount of new main increased size and redundancy, but also uh, multiple new booster pumps that will then feed downhill into some of those designated low pressure zones to help mitigate that issue. The other project where you saw the green squiggly lines on the map earlier on, um, that is coming up the West Loyola Road um, from our Station A on Eloise Circle and going all the way up to Mora. There is a gap on Sun Hills where there's not a need to replace that main. It's already adequately sized at eight inch. Um, but we're improving the backbone. And the reason that there's this gap that you saw on the map that was more that was the original recommendation of the EKI report is at that time, Cal Water funded these other projects and put those in our rates. And now with the 2024 rate case coming, we'll be putting the EKI um, recommendations into play too. So some other improvements that we've got going on, um, Calwater finished our hydraulic modeling for the Los Altos district. We had a station eight rebuild done, which improved tanks and motors and, and pumps at that station. Uh, station 10, which is on uh, Magdalena um, near Blandor, that was rebuilt. In 2023, there is a rate case project to put uh, new wildfire hardening main and pumps control valves at station that is adjacent to the freeway on Magdalena, 280 and Magdalena. And then outside of the, the general area, stations 14 and stations 42, um, those are both getting the same treatment in 2023 and 2024 with additional pumps and wildfire hardening. Um, the reason I mentioned them is they may not be specific to the Mora zone, but they are in the Los Altos district's wildfire interface area. Um, so that kind of surrounds that Rancho San Antonio area. And then all three years, we have additional projects, um, three to four projects each year for wildfire control valves, where we're looking at what our zoning is, uh, whether we have closed valves, uh, that separate zones that can be made into um, either pressure regulating valves or uh, check valves to allow for water to move freely during an emergency without the need for human operation. And that is what I have. Wow, that's great. Wow, that's a lot of information. And uh, so uh, I see Commissioner Tyson, you got your hand up. I'll come to you first. Uh, yeah, I didn't waste any time. Thank you for that presentation. You know, uh, have some history uh, serving with uh, Counts, uh, Commissioner Warren in the past on water supply. I'm really pleased to see progress here on the Cal water, water side. And, and I know uh, Commissioner Yvonne is looking at, at Mora Drive and, and um, uh, it's always been an area of, of concern. You know, there's one calculation in there. I don't know if you can, can address there's where I, I'm going to forget the exact number, but but compared to EKI, the, the flow was something like triple what, what was thought. And I'm puzzled about that because, you know, it's just water. And so I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. I deal with some complicated fluids sometimes. But this is, so can you, can you say, is, there, is this something where there was either, I figure it's either a calculation error or there was a, 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 an assumption about, say, the pipeline or the number of elbows or the elevation change, some, some assumption that was clearly wrong, because that's quite an error. And I'm, I'm just struck by that. I wonder if you can comment. So I can comment for a second and then I'll turn it over to Chris. Um, but you know, uh, initially we didn't have a model when EKI was working on this report. And I'm sorry to say that um, you know, the person who EKI was working with was Ron Richardson, who was my predecessor who retired a couple of years ago. So we don't have a lot of information to the details that were exchanged during that time when the report was being generated, but we are looking at it very carefully um, for future rate cases and in fact this very next rate case and we're comparing it with our model and we're also doing some real-time pressure um, tests to make sure that we're getting as, as accurate information as possible and Chris I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. 
No, I, I think that hits it on the head. I mean, I, I can't speak to what EKI's assumptions were. I did read the, the report. Um, and I think there was some assumptions made as to max day demand and, and variables like that. Whereas the data that I was showing tonight is a real live test. You know, we sent employees out to survey pressure as they operated that under a condition that would simulate a fire um, so that we have real world performance. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Vaughn. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, Chris, thanks. I'm very uh, happy and pleased to hear that um, some some very positive action has been taken in the more in, in my consideration. Um, you know, I've been on the fire board for nearly 10 years and I've been really, really pushing this. And I'm very pleased to see that we're taking some positive action on this. I consider um, Rancho San Antonio one of the biggest target hazards in, in, in the entire city. I, I literally, I mean, there's 4,000 4, acres of open space there. And I'm really, really concerned about it. I want to know, um, and it looks like you know, once you do the improvements up by the tank, that it'll also um, uh, improve the water pressure on Private Mulberry Drive as well. There's several homes there, and uh, would, which back up to the open space, and so, and then all the other homes that you know parallel or um, are, are right up against uh, Rancho. Can you comment on that, please? I can't comment on the defined boundaries at this time, just because we haven't seen final plans yet. Um, but that ridge line specifically at Mora, that's where that pipeline would be coming down from, uh, from the Mora tank down to the intersection of Sun Hills. So our assumption is the intended purpose of this is to mitigate as much of the designated low pressure zone as we can. I just don't know how far that goes um, in either direction of Mora. Gotcha. In the past, they talked about with uh, uh, EKI that there needed to be some sort of a jockey pump at that transition there as the water come out of the out of the tank. And so maybe that's something you guys can look at and your engineers just to make sure that we're uh, we provide coverage in that area. Yeah, definitely. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, Absolutely, and our engineering team is looking at things like this exactly right now for a proposal in this next rate case. Great, thank you. And then uh, one other quick question: What is the completed uh, estimated completed time for that upgrade for the more tank area and the and the uh, the big valve there? So we haven't reached settlement at this point with the Public Utilities Commission. Um, so we're still waiting on approval for that. I know that um, at a much higher level than I have the authority, those things are being discussed with officers and board of directors to decide which projects move forward and which ones need to be held. There's no clear signs that these projects have been contested at all, aside from, uh, you know, the ratepayer advocate basically trying to push back a little bit on things like uh, contingency budget items or special inspection fees, um, things that we include in our projects to handle those contingencies that do pop up with underground construction. That's their job to push back. Um, that's their job to help keep the rates low and we respect that. Um, but there's no indication that they're contesting these projects outright. So I do feel that they would be going forward pretty soon. Gotcha. And one other quick question. Um, Will you guys be advising and keeping the fire uh, board uh, apprised of uh, the results and progress in each area as uh, as uh, work begins to commence? Yes, absolutely. We would be happy to. Great. Thank you so much. Any other comments? Comments from the public? I see a hand up. Uh, Alan, you have the floor. Thank you. I have uh, two questions. My first question is, is when Ron Richardson came uh, to make a presentation a few years ago, he basically said that um, mains couldn't be changed because of wildfire, excuse me, because of fire flow reasons, that the Public Utility Commission would not support um, putting into the rate structure um, changes to the pipes 
solely due to the need for increased fire flow. Has something changed there? And if so, could you speak to that? My second question has to do with uh, my understanding that there is a wildfire detection camera from an organization called PANO located on the Mora tank. If you'd like to explain um, um, what the situation is with PANO, who's, who's uh, funding that operation and who receives uh, information from that wildfire detection camera, I would be very interested in learning. Thank you. Well, let me take a stab. Hi, Alan. Let me take a stab at answering your questions. First of all, historically, yes, that is true. That um, the Public Utilities Commission doesn't normally approve projects for specific um, uh, fire reasons because the the logic, their logic, is that um, you know the whole uh, customer base, all of the ratepayers um, pay for a benefit to one very small part of the district or the community. Um, uh, I believe, I, I don't know exactly the, communi the communication that's been happening with Public Utilities Commission, but um, I believe that some of that logic may be shifting. I, I don't know because I know that we've been able to install more recently um, for wildfire hardening. And another thing is, you know, sometimes we just think it's that important that we'll put it in um, uh, with 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 a, a kind of in advance, hoping that the Public Utilities Commission will reimburse us for what we're doing, just because we believe it's the right thing to do. It's it's a it's um, maybe not the smartest business related decision, but we do feel like it's the most ethical decision. So um, we've moved forward with some of these wildfire hardening projects, and we're hoping to get uh, you know a reimbursement or actually you know um, be able to recover those costs in a later rate case. Um, so yes, historically that has been the case that, um, as I explained, the PUC doesn't approve uh, just a fire uh, hardening for one specific portion of the community. Um, the other part of it, of your question, the pano cameras, um, I've been a little bit removed from that, uh, that from that objective. It's actually been happening up and down the peninsula, um, so I know it's been it's been uh, being conducted with other uh, members of our company. But the theory is that we're putting cameras on our tanks, which tend to be higher uh, portions of. A community because you know we need to have that elevation for uh, water pressure and then you put a camera there and the idea is then that that camera can actually detect uh, smoke sometimes before people can even report it or if someone reports it the fire department won't necessarily know exactly where the fire is based on the report's description but if you look at the pano cameras then you can see kind of where the smoke is and the fire department can go um, to where the fire is more efficient more efficiently because this is somewhat of a pilot I'm actually still learning you know where that information goes who monitors that I actually don't have that information on hand I don't know Chris I know if you have that information I know they've been working with our production superintendent who is Melinda Schmidt um, but Chris do you have any information on the pano cameras beyond what I just mentioned? No, beyond facilitating getting it installed out there, um, it was still in the pilot stage and that's being controlled by uh, customer support side of the house. So there are engineers over at the corporate office in San Jose that were championing that up and down the state. And I can speak just a little bit to the tech and the advantage and why Cal Water decided to work with Pano uh, on that project. So we were approached by Pano. They had an AI system that they had also built out the hardware for, and the AI system was there to try and advance early identification of fire. And one of the things that their AI, um, they believed that it could do was it could differentiate between fog and smoke. And being able to do that allowed them to detect fire much earlier than the standard cameras and some other possibilities that were currently out there. And so they approached us wondering if we would be able to provide them some sites. So we worked with them last <laughs> year to, to evaluate sites based on their needs and were able to find a site that worked for them. They were able to run that pilot. It was uh, successful. And so we have moved forward with, with looking at that a little further. It's a, it's a great tech. It's one more tool in the arsenal to try and fight fire and keep our community safe. And um, we're happy to, we're always happy to explore options like that. Wow. Great answer, very interesting. Thank you all. Um, I, I see no other comments from public or commission. 
In which case, uh, we will now move on to item nine. So thank you. I want to thank everyone from Cal Water for a very detailed report on short notice. Uh, and uh, I think very informative. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having thank you. me. Thank you. Let's see. So moving on to item nine, which is district, district reports, operations, emergency services, CERT, integrated hazardous fuel reduction. Um, let's receive those reports and provide direction to staff. Uh, let's see, CERT program analyst Bibi, I think you're going to present item 9A, the report on CERT. I am, thank you very much. Uh, good evening to commission staff and public. Um, July has been uh, pretty busy already for CERT. Um, we start off this month with our 4th of July parade. Uh, sorry, I'm on a different computer than I normally own and I don't think it's like what I'm doing. Hold on one second there, there we go. Um, so uh, we staffed eight stations along the parade route. Um, I, this was such a great event. I just, I can't stress enough how um, the community really came together. We had, you know, residents, we had town staff, we had city council, we had allied agencies, we had district staff, we had teens. Um, and we provided um, not only um, fun excitement for our residents, but we also uh, helped out the town with um, some traffic control, some we call it light traffic control, um, situational awareness, which is updates on the parade route, and then some basic first aid. Um, I'm happy to report that there was no major incidents. Um, Here's some pictures of us uh, getting ready at our briefing here on the left, and then some different checkpoints we have in some of our volunteers. I'm still, I'm still seeing the front slide. Is that just, there you go. Oh, is it not? Okay, hold on. There you go, just yeah, it's just, it, doesn't, it doesn't like my present. I'm just going to have to keep it out of presentation mode. Let me see if I can try it, this. It again. just download. You're okay there at the end, Victoria. Yeah, it's. I think it's just um, not liking. No, I can't find it. Where did it go? This is why I don't use Apple computers because they can never figure them out on Zoom. Hold on. See, everything always works good when I'm not having to report out anything. There we go. Let's try this. Can you guys see my slides? We're waiting. Double click to enter full screen. I think it might just not be on full screen. I just don't know where they went. That's the problem. Stand by. Well, let's do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna play my teen cert report because I know I have that <laughs> queued up and ready to go, and then I will um, I'll come back to my report. Mm -hmm. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. So um, for Teen Cert, uh, they were out at both of our, our events. Um, and um, before I share the, the video, um, in Cert, we always teach um, to adapt and overcome. Uh, obviously, I need to learn that tonight with my Zoom. Um, but we had um, our Teen Cert for this month got sent away to a basketball um, tournament last minute. So um, it's not our usual look, but, um, and she had some help from her basketball team, but she was able to share about Teen Cert and they also recorded her incident to me. So I am going to play that for you guys right now. Hopefully. Do you see a girl? Not no. yet. Something's happening though. Hang in there. Yeah. You know what? What Can you guys skip, skip me? And I'm going to try and figure out why I'm not. Okay. Let's, let's, let's go to, to uh, 9B. Uh, and we will uh, come back to 9A. 9B is the uh, the mission moment number three video, the evacuation vegetation removal project. Uh, let's see, Vice President Sherlock, do you want to present this one? Thank you so much. And I'm hoping that this link will play. We'll see. Um, so welcome everyone to our third mission moment. Each mission moment uh, gives a visual representation of a project or an activity um, that the district performs that supports our mission and shows an example of how the district improves safety in our community. So tonight we're gonna to see a video on the evacuation vegetation removal projects. And um, just remember that these mission moment videos are multi-purpose. We use them on the website, on our YouTube channel, and for future education on our evacuation route projects. So that people have a, something to reference when they're uh, concerned it's coming into their neighborhood. And uh, thank you, Jackson Ricketts, our videographer, and to the staff who are willing to be videotaped. Uh, it's not always as easy as it might look to be on camera. And then to the staff who provided valuable input. So I'm hoping we can go ahead and run that now. Victoria, I think you had that one too, but we had backup plans. Good, it looks like it's- Can, can you guys see this? 
Okay. Yes. You can see it, but it's not playing yet. No, I haven't played it yet. Okay, here we Perfect. go. Thank you. Hi, Denise Gluen with Los Altos Hills County Fire District. I'm here today to talk about evacuation route hardening, uh, which is roadside vegetation clearing. In my background as a firefighter, I've been to many wildland fires on strike teams and seen the importance of having clear roadways for the egress or exiting of residents in the case of a wildland fire evacuation orders or warnings and for emergency vehicles responding in. Keeping the area cooler without flames along the side of the road is very important. In my background, I'm a, also a master gardener. So some of the things that I've uh, brought into the focus on these vegetation project is the concepts of removing the dead, diseased, dying, and damaged vegetation. I'm Dave Barnett. I'm the operations manager for Los Altos Hills County Fire District. I recently retired uh, from San Jose Fire Department as a battalion chief after spending 25 years there. During my 25 years as a firefighter, uh, I've responded to multiple wildland fires. Evacuation routes are necessary. People need to get out. and. I've been at fires where people haven't been able to get out or people have been trapped. We need these roads for people to get out and we need the roads for the responders and the, the law enforcement to come in. It's one of the reasons why I'm here with the Los Altos Hills County Fire District is because of the program uh, here locally to ensure that people can get out. And it is the highest priority that we have right now. So the vegetation management reduces the fire activity, typically from 30 feet on each side of the road and that way, when the fire approaches the road, it becomes less intense, and therefore the resident is able to pass through, and also emergency responders are able to get in to address and mitigate the fire. We have a uh, very robust program reaching out to the residents to gain a right of entry so that we can then go beyond the right of way, potentially into 30, maybe all the way to 100 feet in a resident if required by fuels and the topography. Anything that we can remove from the dead, uh, a dead component is going to reduce the intensity of the fire as well as be less likely to ignite. Hi, my name is Irene. I am the Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council's project manager, and I'm also an ISA certified arborist. I will be the project manager on the Ultima evacuation route. My team and I walk through your property as you send in right of entry forms, and we flag dead, dying, diseased vegetation, and we're overall looking for plant health. We're also trying to improve the ability for you to evacuate in the case of a fire, and also improve the ability for a fire crew to get to the fire and stop it. Um, my team and I also on site remove trash as we are removing vegetation and thus that is improving the quality of the land and the watershed in the project site areas. Awesome. Thank you, team. Great work. Wow, that's great. Are there any discussion with the commission on that? I'm just, I was smiling all the way through that. That was just uh, wonderful to watch. And some very natural people on camera, I think more so than, than I've seen in, in years past. That was really, uh, really wonderful. Uh, Commissioner Warren? Yeah, no, I just want to say how impressive and professional the whole thing is. And I think it speaks tremendously to the, the effort and you know the staff to pull that together, the project, and then to be able to put a public um, presentation together like this at such a level. So well done. Wow, great, thank you. Any public comment on that, by the way? Just checking, seeing none. Great, thank you so much for all the team involved with that. Um, do we, uh, Victoria, are we ready to go back to item 9A for the CERT report? Or should we yes, continue I reached on? out to my lifeline and okay. um, thank you, Corey, very much. Um, okay, well, I think I left off at talking about the parade. So could we go to the next slide? That'd be great. So there's what I was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully you guys remember, uh, I talked about the checkpoints and then our coverage at eight of the stations. Um, we had 14 certs, uh, three teen certs, and we also had a remote um, net control operator this time. Next slide. 
I thought it'd be kind of cool to show you sort of a couple of tools that we use when we go to these events. Um, they're not just events that we just show up at. We do a lot of prep work. We do briefings, meetings, things like that prior to. So the event map that was given to us from the town is what's going to kind of let us know where we need to be stationed at and kind of uh, different routes that we would have to um, help people get around in case they needed to get around somewhere and couldn't go through the parade route. Um, I also want to show you an example. I know it's kind of small, but um, that's our net control log um, that was done by our net control operator, Larry. Um, so basically, he's just he's just showing every single time that we uh, have communications. So as you can see, it's a lot of writing and a lot of checking in, but it's just a really good example of how um, you know we track and make sure that our, our team is safe and then we know where they are and that we're um, hitting the objectives that we have for um, our events. <clears throat> our allied agencies were also at the parade. Um, I threw myself in front of a fire engine, a police car, some motorcades, um, and some other fun things to get some good pictures. Um, really fun to see um, all of them out having a good time as well. Uh, next slide. And then, of course, we have our town council. Um, there's um, council members Mock Schmidt and Vice Mayor Swan um, and Seely, which is um, uh, Councilwoman Schmidt's dog. And then um, I have to get my picture of Mayor Tyson. I, I think I'm like his personal paparazzi. I, <laughs> I always seem to get him at events with these really cool pictures. So good one, President Spreen and, uh, and uh, Mayor Tyson. I, I don't know, you probably didn't have to go to the gym after that or do any kind of workouts because I know that thing does not move very fast. So um, another great addition to our event. Next slide. Sorry, Corey. Um, okay, well, now we go to the Los Altos Art and Wine Festival, which was the next weekend. Um, we had, um, you know, several certs come out as well as teen certs. Um, our certs helped other people set up their canopies because, uh, you know, those are kind of hard to set up. So once we got ours up, we kind of helped out the whole entire area. Um, we also were asked by Cadre. Uh, Marsha Hobie is now the executive director of Cadre. Um, I think she's come and done a couple of talks on Cadre for us at our uh, some of our last commission meetings. Um, but she is uh, she had asked us to maybe um, have some of her people come and join us um, to talk about um, the Mic Shake app. So the My Shake app uh, gives you about a four to five second warning if there's going to be a 4.5 or greater earthquake that will hit your area. So really good to be able to um, get that quick alert and uh, make sure that you're safe. Um, so we had uh, a couple of teens come out. Uh, they learned from us how to educate the public and uh, interact with the public. And they were able to get, I think it was like 100 or uh, something contacts, which was awesome. Um, and that's our little setup we had um, that was on day one. Um, and then Corey, can you skip the next slide and go to the last one? I think somehow my slides got over. There we go. Yeah, go, go. Sorry, go back to the next one, the last one. There we go. Um, so here's some more pictures of um, our teen search educating the public. Um, we had our prize wheel out there the first day we were out next to Santa Clara County Fire Department. They had their prize wheel. So we kind of utilized their crowds to pull them into our booth, which was a great teamwork. It was really nice to hang out with them. Um, the next day we brought out our prize wheel. Um, that's what our teen certs um, got to, um, to help run that. Basically, you, you, you know, spin the wheel and then you have to answer a preparedness question and then you get a prize. So um, we had some comic books for preparedness out there. We had some coloring books um, and some little tchotchkes for the the kids. Um, we also um, redid our teen cert postcard. Um, and we also have a cert postcard that we handed out as well. Okay, Corey, can you go not the go up two more? Right there. Okay. So also the second day we had, um, we were next to the Palo Alto Animal Control. Um, and um, thank you to uh, Captain Gluen for coming out and um, helping us. Uh, it was a little bit, a little bit toasty out there, but um, so that is Slinky the snake. Um, they brought out some furry friends and some not so furry friends. Um, I stayed away from the not so furry friends and I got to hang out with the furry friends. Uh, but uh, Captain Gluon uh, held the snake for a long time. He seemed to enjoy her. She enjoyed him. And we were able to um, interact with the public on that, uh, that front. So um, just a really great time and a great opportunity for our teens to get out there with our, with our older certs 
and um, you know meet each other and, and work together educating the, the community and it was nice to have people come by um, from you know Los Altos Cert and the hams and things like that and come say hi so um, really enjoyed it uh, as Denise mentioned council member uh, Ma came out um, we saw um, Commissioner Basiji. So it was just a really nice time had by all. Um, and the last slide that I had is out of order right there. Um, this was a chalk painting or chalk uh, writing they did at the 4th of July uh, event, which I thought was really, really very nicely well done. And I just want to say thanks to all the district staff, teen certs and LH certs for their time and efforts, and also to um, the town staff who is always supportive of the district. And we work really well together on some of these events. So um, I just want to say thank you for that. And that is the uh, end of that report. I think I'm going to hold off the teen cert report because I can't seem to pull anything up on my computer. So um, that's fine. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you so much, man. Once again, you show how much energy is happening on the CERT program, which really makes it feel so so vital to be part of this district. So thank you so much for and thank you all the CERT folks for being involved. Any uh, comments or questions from the commission on all those activities? I see none. I see a lot of smiling faces. Thank you for that. Uh, any comments from the public? Seeing none. Great. Thank you. And I guess having completed item 9B, we will skip forward to item 9C which is the uh, Integrated Hazardous uh, Fuels Report. Um, and we will ask uh, Planning Programs and Grants Manager Rendler to please introduce these items, which includes the Altamont Road Project and the HIZ Quarterly Report. I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's hard to follow, it's hard to, uh, follow that wonderful video, but that's what we're gonna talk about. <laughs> So this is our final report. There we go. This is our final our final report that gives the, the numbers and the other types of things that you heard briefly and you saw a lot of the visuals in our in the video. Altamont is our fourth evacuation route and road hardening project. And as you heard in the video, treating the vegetation along evacuation routes increases public safety and access in the event of a wildfire or disaster. This uh, particular project, the partners were Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council, the town of Los Altos Hills, and Santa Clara County Fire Department. We had a lot of successes for this project. We keep getting better and um, growing. During the preparation, the outreach efforts and visibilities of this project, residents to participate by providing their right of entry forms to include their parcels in the vegetation management. And as Dave mentioned in the video, that allows us to get deeper treatment instead of just the right away from the, the town's roads. Those wider roadside areas create a more effective evacuation route. Um, we also had our district in cooperation with County Council and Santa Clara County Fire Department comply with CEQA. Uh, Eugenia, your slide's not moving. Uh, Thank you. We're, we're jinxed tonight, aren't we folks? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> during the operations period, whoops, Let's see, uh, during the operations period, we removed roadside hazardous fuels, the details of which you will hear momentarily from Irene, and we extended beyond the cleanup of a single parcel. And this project aligns with the insurance commissioner's proposed new requirements for recognizing community wildfire mitigation efforts, not just parcel level mitigation efforts. The new exciting part to add to this project to talk about tonight is the telemetry. Telemetry is allowing um, the district to advance project planning and management and is increasing the predictive capability for vegetation volume, project workflow and budgets. We're also tracking hazard trees, infrastructure like cell phone towers, the completion of the work and future vegetation regrowth. We use two methods to gather measurements. Right now we're using the um, unmanned aerial system and the ground surveys, the boots on the ground surveys. You heard a little bit about those from Dave last meeting. And the telemetry data will be vetted with the ground survey data during the telemetry analysis and development. So this picture on the left is um, an early picture of the telemetry estimating the volume of an oak tree. 
And you can see that it's gathered the whole oak tree. And we know that the airspace next to the trunk and, and then the lower branches is not want to pay for, we want to measure, and it, you know, we don't chip air. So one of the things that's happening is we're narrowing down and vetting the data with the boots on the ground collected data in with um, the, the drone volume estimates and making sure that we can get closer and closer to the telemetry accurately measuring what we do chip again you know that's measured on the ground and as we move forward and those those two accuracies come together it will allow us to spot check it will allow us to do better planning for workflow and it'll allow us to write better rfps to narrow down and get the accuracy for contractors as well so next we will talk about the measurements and the operations overview from Irene. Thanks, Eugenia. Um, my name is Irene. I was the project manager on the Ultima um, evacuation route. It was great to be part of another project with the fire district. Um, we did take a few measurements during the project. So we did a treatment depth of 10 to 50 feet off the roadside, and we did both sides of the Ultima road. Um, in total 4.41 miles, and that resulted in 9.88 acres treated and a total biomass chipped of 355 cubic yards. Um, that biomass chipped, tree, different tree species were surveyed on the ground, and those were redwoods, eucalyptus, and oak. Excuse me, I think you need to um, advance the slide. No, this is... We're still on, we're still on Irene's slide. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so that covered the measurements for the Altima evacuation route project and then operations overview. It was a really successful project in my opinion. Um, we did have a start date of May 16th and we concluded our project on Wednesday, May 25th. Um, we had a crew on site, we did run into some some hurdles with COVID um, and illness, and um, we were able to continue with our projected start date, May 16th, and we were able to get a crew of seven people with negative COVID tests, a chipping truck, a supervisor, and our timetable was maintained um, because of the flexibility. Um, and I believe that concludes my update. So we have one more slide. My apologies. Okay. Denise is going to talk to us about the lessons learned on this project. So I have brought these up a little bit in past updates, but um, this is one of the projects that we did in the hotter months. Uh, past projects have been later in the fall. So weather hasn't been as much impact except in the case of rain uh, in the Moody El Monte project. Uh, but we did find that crew... Um, Stamina was reduced on, we had uh, half of the days over 90 degrees. Uh, we could definitely see that in duration of the project that the, they still worked very hard, but you could tell that um, that, uh, that heat does take a toll. We also have uh, found extensive poison oak. Um, we did have riparian area along this also. So as you know, in the past uh, projects, we cannot treat uh, the riparian areas per se. Those are tagged off as sensitive habitats. Um, we also have species that are protected. Um, Irene spoke of that in the evacuation video. So that tagging represents both of those. So again, being ecologically conscious. Um, and again, we were looking to have uh, retention of species that were non-invasive. Um, and then the uh, goal was to make a possible ignition sor source reduction in uh, imagining a car fire starting on the side of the road and spreading into the vegetation. So that reduction was done vertically and horizontally along the route. Um, and again, that increases the um, access for emergency vehicles, which are very large coming in to allow also the vehicle egress of residents leaving at the same time. So again, uh, poison oak, heat, uh, two of our, our bigger um, challenges. And then also we would like to uh, really put on appreciation for the residents that participated in the right of entry, because uh, that did allow us to do a little deeper uh, treatment on some, some key parcels. One of the other uh, 
positives is in improving visibility. So we're really aware of um, roadways that enter and exit to make sure that we increase the vi visibility on those. And uh, again, uh, that pretty much covers what, uh, what we had in this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any comments or questions from commission members? And it's great seeing I mean, and, uh, the progress of our ability to tackle projects like this is really impressive, given where we started on our first one to this. I know this is a much bigger project and, and through some, some new, new uh, obstacles at us. Uh, so thank the, the entire team for really tackling this. And uh, each one increases our ability for the next one. So uh, uh, thank you all. And it was, it was a really a big project. Let's see, shall we move uh, Joan on? Has, uh, Joan has her hand raised. Please, Joan. Yeah, hi, Denise. I just had a question. How can we find out the rules around the riparian areas, um, what we can and can't do? Just because we have one coming up against our road that is heavily um, covered by brush. And I'd love to know that more about the rules around it. What's the best way so, to learn? Not to divert, if it's okay, I'm gonna let Irene start. And if there's anything that I can add additionally, since she is an arborist and has uh, more specific, since she's project manager, more specific uh, interactions with the biological company or the company that does the biological surveys and the riparian area surveys. That'd be awesome. And we can take it offline if you'd like. I just didn't know who to talk to. Yeah, I was like, we hire, um, we contract out um, for the bio survey. Um, so a biologist just comes in from Dudek in this instance, and um, she provides, she does the walkthrough. Um, she identifies birds' nests, riparian areas. And within her report, she states that we have to stay 25 feet out from the bank of the waterway. Great. Thank you for that. Appreciate awesome. it. Any other comments or questions from the public? Seeing none. Uh, thank you so much. We will move on to item 9D, uh, which is the Cal OES FEMA Hazardous Mitigation Grant Update. Um, Actually, I believe we have one more item under 9C. Oh, okay. So we'll just jump ahead. Thanks, Denise and Irene. And we'll hear our HIZ uh, yes. Q2 report from Irene, please. <laughs> Thank you, Eugenia. Um, so our HIZ report, I believe the last time I spoke about it was in March. So from April to June, we had five incoming requests for HIZs. Um, one has been completed. Uh, we have uh, one that we are unable to contact and two that we are attempting contact, still not waiting, still waiting to hear back from those folks. And then one is being scheduled by the end of July. So um, that one is in the works right now. So for a quarter one and quarter two total, we have 15 completed HIZ assessments um, and definitely have the capacity to do more. So please tell your neighbors, be happy to do some more. Um, and that is the HIZ update for April through June. Thank you very much. Is there now any comments, any comments, questions from commissioners, seeing none or the public? Seeing none, thank you so much, Irene. Uh, thank you, whole team, for everything. Thank and you. now we will move on to item 9D, uh, which is uh, also with uh, grant update. Uh, this, is the, this, this is the Cal OES FEMA Hazardous Mitigation Grant Update uh, with a report by Planning Programs and Grants Manager Rendler. Please offer us the report. Thank you. So our, we've received six additional requests for information. Um, pieces. Some of them are fairly straightforward and some of them have required us to redo some budgeting hours and clarify some of the uh, scope of work and those types of items. The June RFI was completed and accepted by Cal OES, so we're continuing to just cycle through every time they bring us something. And the planning is proceeding for the two requirements of the sub-application that we brought DUDEC on board last month for, which is the environmental compliance and the visual assessment survey. And that that's a couple components that, that um, we have to interact with the, the CEQA laws as well, as well as the Caltrans visual impact assessment rules. So those are just getting started and the field visits are just being scheduled now for those. End of report. Great, thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay, any from the public? 
Seeing none, I think we're done with that item. We will now move on to item 10. Uh, this is the report and considering potential actions on development of a successor strategic plan. Um, let's see, this item will be brought by District Consultant Scott. Can you please present the report? Hello, thank you, President Spring. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can I share my screen, Corey? I, I will pull up a few slides. I just have a few slides to go through tonight and then would like to have the commission have some discussion and provide some direction on a few items with regard to the strategic plan. So with that said, um, let me go ahead and bring up my slides here and we'll get right started. Um, so um, let's start at the beginning and that is the district's mission. Um, and the district exists to protect the lives, property and environment within the district um, through education, prevention, protection and emergency response services all the while being good financial stewards of our taxpayer funds. And the, oh, now I can't advance. Um, wow, I can't move my slides. Let's try again. Ah, um, so the strategic plan provides the vision and the path for how we can meet our, our, um, our mission. And here at the district, we consider the strategic plan to be one of the three pillars. The other two being the annual budget in which the commission decides how to allocate resources and the CWPP Annex 4, which provides technical and uh, fire science guidance. And these three elements, these three pillars, advise the district strategy and operation. Let's see if I keep moving here. So um, just a little bit of history, so everybody's on the same page. The district's first strategic plan was facilitated by the Center for Public Safety Excellence. And through a series of meetings, including community participation, uh, this document was produced for a five-year period. Um, the same firm was contacted to return for the successor strategic plan, but they were not able to travel from the East Coast during COVID. So the process was modified to meet public health requirements and um, developed a follow-up strategic plan for a shorter two-year period for calendar years 21 and 22. This shorter time frame was selected due to uncertainty of the pandemic and the management audit process. Um, the current strategic plan uh, has six main goals and just very briefly, those include updating the CWPP, Annex 4 addendum, um, uh, watching and monitoring the two countywide studies which are still ongoing, um, implementing hazardous fuel reduction programs, creating policies and procedures for water systems at the district, um, expanding communication and education efforts and sustainability and resilience of the district as an organization. And there's some new concepts and these are just a few examples of things I think we'll be talking about for consideration into the next version of the strategic plan. And these include measurement. We've heard tonight about um, a variety of new technology tools, including telemetry, GIS, use of a drone, and there are others. Um, the district is learning about and more involved in environmental and CEQA efforts. And working with our regional partners, we're taking on larger projects, as well as um, participating in grant funding with other regional partners and considering other projects for um, district related uh, items as well. So we have, um, this is July, uh, we have just a few months to put together a successor strategic plan. And this would be an overview of the steps we could take. Um, 
What we are proposing tonight for the commission to discuss is to form an ad hoc subcommittee that would serve as advisors and provide guidance in preparing materials and doing research and considering concepts um, to bring back and discuss with the commission. Um, and we would create a work plan for this remaining few months of this year, which would include um, an approach to involve community and stakeholder input. And the ad hoc subcommittee would assist in providing guidance, but as the facilitator, I would prepare materials, write and draft and prepare revisions. Um, and then the commission would be reviewing and discussing and making all of the decisions. And we would anticipate having items on agenda for the September and October commission meetings, possibly also the November with an adoption scheduled by December of 2022. Um, and then just to confirm um, the approach we have considered is an ad hoc subcommittee, which would not be a Brown Act committee um, and would be able to meet in between commission meetings and again, review materials and provide guidance um, as, as documents are prepared. And so um, tonight, what we'd like to do is facilitate some discussion with the commission and talk about um, the term for the next strategic plan um, and whether it would make sense to continue with an incremental approach and look at another two years going forward that would allow the district to be nimble and respond to changes as they happen um, or consider a different time frame. And the second topic is seeking volunteers up to three commissioners to serve on an ad hoc subcommittee for the strategic plan to provide guidance over the next four months or so. We would estimate about four to six meetings in addition to commission meetings through the end of the calendar year, maybe somewhere around 10 hours. So um, that concludes my presentation. So let me um, exit out of here and um, we can have some discussion. And let me ask first if there are any questions about the slides or about the past um, experience with the strategic plan at the district. Okay, not seeing any hands. Um, how do the commissioners feel about a term of two years for the next strategic plan, which would allow us to build upon the one that exists right now and consider ways to modify um, and add to it over the course of the next two years? Any Didn't thoughts, like to... any thoughts or comments? I've, uh, you know, I, I should add, I was involved, I, I think I was on the ad hoc subcommittee that helped put this incremental one together that's now ending. Um, so I've been to that process once. Oh, good, we have some other comments here. So let's, I'm gonna start from left to right in no order. Uh, Commissioner Warren, you're first on my screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, so question, two years, two years has gone by really fast since we did the last one. My thinking is I'm inclined to go for a longer time period, four to five years, uh, because it is a strategic plan. I, we, I, we, for, rash, for very good reasons, we made it for two last time. Uh, we're gonna make this investment and put the time into it. I'm gonna advocate that we do a four or five year time frame for the plan is my thinking. That's, my, that's all I had. Commissioner, your next on the list is Commissioner Sherlock. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing, Mark. I think that if we're going to do that work, we, we should make it a longer term. I think five years makes absolute sense. It won't be a round number when we're finished. It'll be you know seven years since the last, but I think that would make sense. I, it, we have enough knowledge now, I think, about where we're going to be and what we're going to have available that we can do that planning. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Tyson. I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, the whole idea of a strategic plan is you put yourself in that mindset and then you, you create something and then you don't try to micromanage it. It's sort of it's setting a, a bit of a vision. It's kind of like your investment balance, rebalancing. You don't do that every week. You know, you do it on a, on a sequence. So I, I actually like four or five years myself. Okay, I'm catching it. Oh, uh, Commissioner Taka. 
I was just curious to see why the staff are recommending a two-year plan versus a five-year as, as has been customary in the past. Sure. Uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Kavita. I think um, the, the idea that there's still some flux in our um, regional environment right now um, that would allow us to reassess in two years. Um, we also are still in a bit of a COVID environment. I know we're shifting in and out um, and we don't have a good recommendation at this moment how to, to get um, community and stakeholder uh, involvement. Um, so I think those are the two main factors. Um, but again, it's up to the commission to decide. And um, I think this discussion is very helpful to inform that decision. I can make a comment also um, that the two countywide fire review studies are still in progress and we've not gotten any kind of indications back as to how that's going to fare for the district. There are some issues coming up in front of the Board of Supervisors in the next couple of months uh, that are going to be very critical to the district. And so I guess it's just not really having the, the continuity of the district right now to be able to, to look forward four or five years, that was weighing on my mind also. So uh, those are kind of the, the items that come to my mind, but either one's okay. You know, we can flex and be adaptable. We've shown the ability to do that. Thank Mr. you. Taka, you have some more comments? Uh, yes, and those are exactly my thoughts, given the fact that we had two very out, uh, two outstanding studies that would define um, the future and the role of the fire district. I think it might be more prudent to have a two-year plan and really double down and focus the energies to meet the challenges that lie ahead in the next two years, and then uh, come up with a five-year plan. But I would be open to a five-year plan too, but... Uh, at this point, I feel given the uncertainty surrounding us, two years might be best. Before I comment, I want to turn to our other two commissioners, uh, Mr. Basiji or Vaughn, do you have any comments or thoughts? Uh, should I go first? Sure. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> My feeling is that, uh, first of all, I have not been involved uh, in the nitty gritty details or for that matter at any level. All I've heard is secondhand, uh, <clears throat> basically mentoring from uh, Jay and from uh, uh, President Spring. So I think from my point of view, um, the most natural thing to do is to go for a longer period. On the other hand, I think the saying goes that strategies are made out of major tactical moves. So if the major tactical move over the next two years involved the uh, the incoming uh, information from the district, from the, from the county and other aspects, um, maybe it's not a bad idea to just essentially do a shorter one as uh, Commissioner Conkham mentioned, and then do a next one at the end of that period. But again, I think five years just as good from what you So it could, it sounds I, not as good, but as long as it sounds logical. Thank you. Commissioner Vaughn, any thoughts? Um, I could go either way. I think two years, um, uh, I think we accomplished a little bit more because we, we tend to be a little bit more uh, aggressive in our approach, uh, especially since uh, the unknowns that we have. Uh, but, but I could go either way. I, I, I would lean towards two years if, uh, if it were up to me, so. Thank you. Uh, per, uh, Commissioner Tyson, your hands up. Uh -huh. I, eventually you'll get to speak. Uh, I'm happy to wait for everyone else. You, you know, uh, this whole thought about waiting for county studies so that we know what to do. I feel like I've played in, in that. I've been in that play before. And so I, I almost feel like the contrary. And that is, why don't we send the signal that we're, we've got a longer time frame, and that, that that's our plan. And rather than sit and wait for these other groups to figure things out. And, and having said that, three years might be the right answer for all I know. It's just something in, in the middle there. Uh, I mean, the whole idea of a st strategy is that it, it is over a longer time period rather than just be uh, operational. Thank you. Commissioner Sherlock? Yeah, I, I really agree with that. And I think that <clears throat> it's better to have a longer term vision anyway. 
I think we don't want to be stymied by the limitations that keep getting put on us and that we don't have that longer term vision. I think it's really important to have something to work towards over the next five years. Now, we don't have to put, someone mentioned, I think maybe it was Jim, the tactical elements in for all of the details that would have to happen within those, those strategies that we earmark. But I think having that longer term vision totally makes sense. And I think it, it will have meaning for the community. So. Any other comments? I can, personally, I, I sort of, uh, Commissioner Tonka's comments resonated with me. Um, that's kind of where I was coming from at the start of this, which is that, and, and probably that's mostly because my experience has, I came in at the tail end of the implementation of the five-year plan and then participated in the two-year development of that plan and have been through it. And I, I just see what a different organization we've become and how quickly things have changed. That's, that's why I tend to uh, gravitate towards the shorter plan, but, but I really don't have a strong lean that way. I think if we do want to go towards a longer plan, we want to build in, we should build into it some sort of review in an ongoing fashion. Um, so that, uh, you know, I, I think that this is a very different group than it was two years ago. And I expect it, I hope that it will be a very different group two years from now. Um, I think taking a five-year vision would be a fine thing to do. I think that may inform the coming discussion of how long that process may take, because I tend to think that a five-year vision plan may take more than the, the, the fairly aggressive schedule that has been sort of uh, laid out by Marcy there. Um, but I think as long as we can do some sort of, if we do a four or five-year plan, I'd like to see some sort of milestones in between where we could review it and modify it and not picture it as a five-year frozen thing. That'd be my only thoughts. Stunned everyone to silence. Oh, Commissioner Warren. Yeah, so Roger, I think you're right. I mean, I, I'm I'm inclined, I'm still inclined for the longer vision because it's not just where I want us to be in two years, it's where I want us to be in five years. We've got to point the ship in that direction. Now, is you know, to your point, things can change. And these are plans. And you know, as someone once told me, the plan is the plan until the plan changes. And so I think I, I like the idea of a five-year vision of where we want this organization to be in five years. That doesn't mean that in two years, we can't revisit this and say, okay, two years ago, this is what we thought the direction should be. We can, we can adjust, you know, the, the world has changed around us. We need to adjust. Uh, but I would like us to look five years into the horizon. Where do we want to be? There's, there's large things that I think this organization will be capable of doing in five years. And so I don't want to set our event horizon to just two years. That's why I still am inclined to a longer term plan. Mm -hmm. Your reactions? Well, I mean, if I may respond, you said Jim, CG. Please. Uh, most companies do a one year CG plan, not two year. Oftentimes the uh, argument goes or reasoning goes that in two to three years, the world changes so much that it becomes very innocuous to try to plan that far ahead. So in, in my viewpoint, there's a, a great deal of visioning that can be established uh, for, a two, within a, for a two or three year plan involving hardening of the town as a whole, many other things that we plan to do, working with the state and all the rest of it. And if you just uh, have a grand vision for five years, it may not be as meaningful, but that's just my view. Excellent comments from on all sides and uh, difficult decision. Other comments? Anyone wants to argue either way? It's Denise, I'll just bring up one little Please. comment. We will in five years be at uh, the end of our contract uh, with the county fire district. Just not, mm -hmm. doesn't, just as a, a timing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yes, Eugenia, I see your hand up. Thank you. The other um, thing that you may want to consider is as you enter the arena of grants, the grant contracts are often three-year programs. So in order to apply for a grant, you've laid out a 30 or 33-month work workflow to apply for a grant. So 
you're you're automatically pushing yourself in at least a 36 month direction when you make a decision for the different types of grants you'd like to participate and apply for. Mm -hmm. So I've heard some uh, strong comments for four to five years. Um, I've heard some reasoning for two to three years uh, with less strident um, passion. Uh, so I wonder if the four to five year folks would like to make a motion or actually, I guess this is really direction. So we don't have to make a motion, but we do have to come to some agreement. So um, I'm waiting for someone to push us over the edge because we're kind of uh, right here in the middle. Does someone want to sort of uh, pick up the, okay, Warren? Uh, I just want to bring a point, Jim, I, your annual planning comment, you know, is, is quite a, you know, appropriate. There's no reason that we can't set a vision, a longer term vision, but that actually we as an organization shouldn't, we should probably be holding an annual planning discussion of what are the goals? We've got a grand five-year plan or four-year plan, whatever, but what are, the, what are the interim milestones we want to achieve within the next 12 months? And to set more of the tactical midterm direction for the staff, um, you know, how do you know those incremental milestones? How do we get there? Um, is uh, is a suggestion that I think as an organization would be beneficial. More of you know, organizations, you know, and I don't know how we do it. The Brown Act compliance, but they have offsites and they do planning discussions, and so. Yeah, you know, I'm open for th those kind of discussions also. So we set kind of long-term visions and then how do we operationalize that in the direction to the staff to go make it happen over a, you know, a, the upcoming year. Let me ask Marcy. Marcy, if we were to, to set out for a four-year strategic plan, um, would this process look different and potentially longer? So by the way, I, I'm assuming that we don't, you know, even though the strategic, the current strategic plan runs out at the end of this year, it's okay if it, still in the next one goes into the beginning of next year. You know, it, right. There, I can't think of a ramification. Mm -hmm. you, you know, if if um, the plan was intended to be shorter term last time through December, and if this group is still discussing. Um, I can't think of a ramification for not having an, an adopted plan in place. Um, I think um, having a calendar year basis is helpful, um, but it wouldn't have to be. Um, okay. So I, I think you're right. I, that shouldn't force us into a path that we might not want to take. The reason where my question comes from is, you know, I, I'm, I can go either way. And if we do yeah. do a four-year one, I wouldn't want to, I don't want to feel rushed with it. I mean, yeah. granted, I want to do things quickly, but I wouldn't want to feel forcing it into a time frame. So I'm just wondering, you know, making sure we all understand what the, the time frames, how they fit. And let's do it right if we do a four-year one. And I don't, I don't have a sense of how long that takes because I was not involved with the five-year one. So I don't know. I know, and that was the first time we've done one and, and a lot yeah. of me public meetings in the pre-COVID yeah. days went into that. So again, right. I don't have an intuitive sense of, how much time it would take to, 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 to properly do a four-year plan? Well, I think that's part of the work for this, this um, ad hoc committee uh -huh. to work through that and really come up with a work mm -hmm. plan that is doable. And it depends to some extent on people's schedules. And then this commission meets once a month. Um, and so I think that would be incumbent upon us to bring back to the group some options for how to proceed in a timeline. Yeah, I think that that's, a, you brought something. I think one of the things that would help sway me in a direction is to see who would like to volunteer the ad hoc subcommittee. Um, I would certainly allow those, those volunteers uh, a, a louder voice and a uh, stronger sway. Are there any people who'd like to volunteer for that? I think Roger, I've spoken enough that I think I've volunteered myself again. <laughs> I'm, I never would have thought that, but I'm happy to hear that volunteering. Great, thank you, sir. Would, it, would someone else like that uh, sets the tone for the ad hoc subcommittee right there? I see a hand up from Commissioner Sherlock, who's who's muted, but I still accept that as a as a yes volunteering. 
Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, is do we have a we two would be sufficient? A third, if there's someone else who would like to. Um, third, somebody has to break the you know. The tie. John and I get into a deadlock. Who knows what could happen, right? want to put there in a way i'm trying to keep myself out of it but uh, i mean I, I would if i if needed but uh i'd like to be the facilitator on this more more than the uh the central voice and uh i'd actually be happy right now with these two to start the process off to work with perhaps uh, i'm just brainstorming this to work with marcy to set up a schedule and plan for an appropriate next, uh, you know, how much public input it needs, um, what work would need to go into it, but it's four, three years, four years or five years, the proposal for that and have the two of you with Marcy bring back mm -hmm. a set of plans. I, and that might be most efficient as well. Okay. Uh, uh, you Commissioner Tyson, you're muted. You wanna... I saw Commissioner Tyson with a fingers and hands up, but he's muted. It was an ambiguous uh, hand gesture, I know. Yeah. Uh, I I was it was that's because I you're in I'm very comfortable with the two of them doing this too. Um, I don't know whether I'm having to do a campaign over the next four months, and therefore it gives me pause to say I I would not be committing at this. Point. Completely understand. Um, and that's the same reason I've been I'm holding back as well. <laughs> no problem. Um, so I, I I'm proposing the two of them. Um, and Marcy to, to get together and, and discuss what they think the, the pillars of this plan should be and how long it would take it and to come back in the near future with, with the, or the roadmap. Okay. And any comments and thoughts about what this plan should accomplish for us? Because, you know, it's, uh, I don't, um, I think it's up to us to decide what we want the plan to do for us. It's not what our previous plans have done. So I, I'm, Look forward to that, to your folks' vision of that. Marcy has the sound. Yeah, um, thank you very much for volunteering. I think we can really get working and bring back some options uh, for the August um, commission meeting for the group mm -hmm. to consider and um, hopefully finalize a path forward and decide then um, how we'd like to move forward. So I think that sounds great. Okay. Um, let's see, Chris, do we need to make a motion on any of this or is that sufficient direction with, uh, oh, no, there would be a motion. I'm not Chris, but <laughs> I <know. laughs> Chris, Chris, you're muted. Oh, Chris, you're muted. I think he's telling us we need a motion. For Sorry. A I, I was going to say a concurrence with, you know, no objections noted, but Corey's correct. Probably it's better for the minutes to just do a, a, a quick motion. Okay. All right, so to give you one, Roger, you know, Warren moves to create an, um, let me make sure, Chris, keep me honest here, the right language, um, an ad hoc subcommittee for the strategic plan steering group. I think Both it's the, called the ad hoc uh, strategic plan subcommittee. There it is, and, yep. And I'll just clarify for the record that because it's an ad hoc subcommittee, it will not be subject to the Brown Act. And at this time, the members are, are Warren and Sherlock. Any second? I'll second. Hey, there we go. I was hoping Joan would do that. OK, um, any discussion? I know we've discussed it. Any, any further commission discussion on the motion? Any public discussion on that motion? Seeing none, let's have a roll call. District Clerk. President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Okay. And the commission has approved the creation of the ad hoc subcommittee with commissioners Warren and Sherlock serving seven to zero. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for this discussion and, uh, and your participation. participation. Um, okay, that does it for item 10. Uh, we will now be moving past item 11, which we uh, previously removed from the agenda to move to item 12, which is 
commission member reports. Um, let's see, uh, are there any future agenda? This is an opportunity for commissioners to provide reports or any other agenda topics for the future. Any comments from the commission on that? This is historically a fairly bare item. Seeing no such comments, any public comment? Oh, Commissioner Sorry, uh, was... Heisen breaks the, the, the string of an empty agenda item. I was, I was, I'm so slow. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I just wanted to mention something really interesting happened in our town in the last month. And that is one of our uh, committee members in the town on the Environmental Initiatives Committee, Anand Ran Ranganathan, mm -hmm. uh, applied some really, really nice effort to encourage the, the fire district or, or, or the county fire to use biodiesel and improve our kind of greenhouse gas inventory for the, for the town. And, and it took some doing and I got to give him some credit. And, and he, there was a nice article I saw on July 11th and Joe Simidian's office uh, complimented him too. And I just thought a nice effort of an active engaged citizen pushing for something that was important and he, and he, he kind of got it done. And I just think that's, uh, I, I applaud his efforts and, and think that serves as a really good example. That's great. I agree. It shows that one person can make a difference and everyone should take that to heart. Thank you very much. Excellent item. Okay, um, we will now move on to item B, 12B, which is the discussion of the next regular meeting, which is scheduled to take place August 16th, uh, 2022. Um, I, don't, I don't know if anyone has attendance issues, this being the towards the end of the summer. Um, we'd like to keep it scheduled if we could, um, but if people's travel plans in the summer get in the way of that, we would, I would understand. Didn't we traditionally take it off or skip the August meeting? Yeah, sometimes we have. We have a number of, the reason why I'm hesitant to at okay. the moment is we have a number of items under discussion for contracts. Um, and uh, we'd like to have the option of having this meeting if we could. If Again, if we find everyone's traveling or, or if we find the agenda to be extra light, we could cancel that. But this time, I think there's some items that might still need to come back. Um, I'll offer uh, General Manager Logan, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or your needs for this meeting in August. Um, yes, well, the, uh, the main need that I think uh, Corey and I have is the uh, financial auditor uh, agreement. We need to get that back to the commission in August. Mm -hmm. Corey, do you wanna speak to that? Oh, just, yeah, um, yeah. since we've moved it from uh, today's, uh, meeting um it will have to be on the august meeting so there will have to be an august meeting and i hope that uh the commission can kind of confirm their attendance so that we know what to expect should yeah, be a I short meeting um, it should be a short meeting exactly be, yes i still intend to be here i i have uh Assuming travel doesn't go haywire, I have travel near that date, but not on that date. So I tend to be here. And uh, Commissioner Tyson? I, I, I've raised my hand just to alert you that I that I do have a conflict. I will be on a business trip to Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the time zone difference, I don't think I could easily uh, fit that. Okay, good to know. Okay. So, anyway, so we, we'll keep that on the books. Um, if people's plans uh, do create more conflicts, please let us know and we will uh, work accordingly. But if not, we will plan for a very light uh, and without significant reports in mm -hmm. August, we will keep it light for everybody to get through just required uh, business. So this will help our staff um, and to get things done. And uh, that, that'll be our August plan. Okay, great. Um, any, any other comments on that? None from the commission I see. Any public comments on that? Seeing none. In that case, we will now move on to item 13, adjournment. This concludes the July 19th, 2022 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The meeting is adjourned at 9.16 p.m. And as discussed, the next regular meeting will take place via Zoom on August 16th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Uh, Cert General Analyst, Analyst BB, please stop the recording.